And we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker, putting the fun in fundamentalism. This is Pastor Mike, and I am online, and I am live, and good to be here with you today, coming to you from our top secret broadcasting bunker at Area 52, which is right next to Melbourne, Australia, in case you're looking on a map and looking for it. That's where we are today, and today is going to be as promised, as I said on Tuesday, today, I I should, like Benny Hinn, today is your day. Um, I'm going to answer your online questions, your emails, your gripes, if you have a gripe. And I think the first email that I have up is, I don't know if it's a gripe or not. I I don't know that I quite understand uh, the point of whatever this guy's saying. But anyway, I'm going to attempt. I'm going to attempt to answer it anyway, doing it live on the cuff. Is it on the cuff or off the cuff? Off the cuff, maybe. Anyway, with very little or no preparation, I do have a couple things I want to look at um, at the beginning here. Just a couple news stories that I thought was interesting. Uh, Here is one from Reuters. A bionic eye has given an Australian woman partial sight, and researchers say it is an important step towards eventually helping visually impaired people get around independently. One of my favorite shows when I was a when I was a young man that I almost never got to watch because, because it came on on Sunday nights was the bionic man I loved that show and um, here so here's a story then they, they called it the six million dollar man and in 1973 74 75 so around in there that's like an astronomical amount of money nobody had ever heard of six million dollars man that is a lot Six million dollars is like every time Obama moves, the government spends six million dollars at every second. Anyway, Diane Ashworth, who has severe vision loss due to the inherited condition retinitis pigmentosa, was fitted with a prototype bionic eye in May at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. It was switched on a month later. I mean, she had to wait a month and they switched it on. What did they like? All of a sudden, I could see a little flash. It was amazing, she said. Every time there was stimulation, there was a different shape that appeared in front of my eye. The bionic eye designed and built and tested by Bionic Vision of Australia, a consortium of researchers partially funded by the Australian government, is equipped with 24 electrodes with a small wire that extends from the back of the eye to a receptor attached behind the ear. I just had my eyes examined uh, Monday. And they had to, uh, they, they did the thing where they, I forgot what it's called. Anyway, they opened my eye way up. And the, the circle of my eye was like this big around. Dilated. They dilated my eyes. And they were looking for signs of diabetes back in here, and they didn't see it. That's a good sign. Anyway, um, we are turning into robots, aren't we? We are turning ourselves into mechanically combined with human tissue there is there's there's new stories out every week about and in fact i've saved some of them on my ipad uh and i should have brought them with me but anyway um the the ability of the researchers right now to relate technology to the human fine and to human frame and connect it to the human mind that ability right now it was visualized you know in the 70s 60s 50s but now we are in the age where we are going to see this come to pass in our lifetime. Ray Kurzweil brings up the idea that by 2045, mankind will be immortal. Bill Nye, the science bow tie guy, telling everybody we need to believe in evolution. And there is, there is a reason why they want everybody to believe in evolution. That there is coming a day when man is going to bring himself to a new level, a a new paradigm, there's going to be a revolution. There's going to be a shift. There's going to be a reformation take place. I want you to remember that I said all that. And it's going to excel mankind. It's going to alter his DNA. He's going to evolve into a higher species. Mankind will be immortal. He will never die. He will be exactly 
the way the serpent promised Eve in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, ye shall, if you just do this now, ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. Ben Yamin, whose name means son of the Yamin. No, just kidding. Son of the right hand. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Wednesday slammed the wide international participation at a non-aligned summit in Tehran as a stain on humanity following Iran's denial of Israel's right to exist. Today, over 120 countries are in Tehran saluting a regime that not only denies the Holocaust, but pledges to annihilate the Jewish state, brutalizes its own people, colludes in the murder of thousands of innocent Syrians, and leads millions in chanting, Death to America, death to Israel, he said. So many in the international community appear to have learned nothing. I think this is a disgrace and a stain on humanity, Netanyahu said in a statement. Does anybody hear sabers rattling? in the Middle East. What does that have to do with anything? With anything? And, and I want you to, I don't know, I, I, I tell people I don't know everything. I really don't. I read the Bible and I go, oh, I get it. I get that. I get that. Then I read something and I'm going, I don't know what that means. But I want you to, um, I, I want you to think of something that Jesus said. He told everybody that in, 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 I'm looking in Matthew 24, and there's others, other places that, um, well, let me read Matthew 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples, and I want you to not just think of what Matthew 24 says as far as prophecy is concerned, but I want you to look at the language of your King James Bible in Matthew 24, 1, and I want you to notice the symbolism of the actions of Jesus, because I think they're relevant. I really do. Because... Here we have Jesus who goes to his own people, and they deny him. They want nothing to do with him. They mock him. They scorn him. They whip him. They beat him in the face, rip the hair off his face, spit on him, scourge him, drag him up, strip him down naked, hanging there to die a very suffering death on the cross, and they hate his guts. And so, and Jesus knows this. And so I want you, want you to look at verse 1 of chapter 24. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. You think about the spiritual significance of that. This is the temple. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Um, I, I, would, I just cannot fathom in my mind ever wanting the living breathing, true, righteous, and holy God not living in me. I, I never want to even fathom that idea. A, a day without Christ in me, on me, by me, around me, behind me, before me, I never, I never want a day in my life without Christ the leadership, the blessing, the grace, the mercy, the chastening, the love, the correction of Jesus Christ. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Man. And his disciples came to him, and you understand the symbolism of it, because from this day forward, probably somewhere in the neighborhood, but about 40 years later, somewhere on AD 70, exactly what happened to the temple. It was just most of it was destroyed. And this is where the preterists get all off on there. Well, it's already been fulfilled, you idiot. But anyway, his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And I want you to notice that he, he, they specifically said the buildings, plural, of the temple. Not just the temple building itself, but the whole, um, the whole compound, as it were. And they showed him all those buildings, and he said, I'm telling you, not one stone would be left on another. So in A.D. 70, it's all gone except one wall. The Wailing, well, they call it the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. It is a remnant of the buildings, plural, of the temple. And the stones are still on top of one another there. 
And and you have to understand the nature of prophecy. God speaks once. God speaketh twice. And so it was a partial fulfillment in A.D. 70. But you go there and you look and you see stone upon stone and say, ha, yeah, God didn't get that one yet. I think it's going to happen. I think, according to what I see in the scripture, I think we're going to see Jerusalem compassed about with troops. I think that that wall is coming down. I think that there is going to be something going on in Jerusalem that's going to cause that wall to come down and absolutely, perfectly fulfilling every word that God said. God does not leave words out there hanging empty. If he speaks a word, it happens exactly the way he says. And so I, I just kind of, uh, I'm, I'm looking at this going, you know, I, I, God has kind of put me as a watchman over the church, over church-related issues and things like that. And I don't, um, I don't keep much in step with Israel politics and Israel happenings and things like that. But this one I think I get. I think that there is going to be a very, very terrible thing happen in Jerusalem one of these days. I think that according to what I see in the scripture. Uh, this was on Drudge Report today. Federal court rejects Texas voter ID law. Here we go. Now, I want you to understand the context here. The government's forcing you to buy health insurance because you're a citizen of the United States of America. Oh, but if you're not a citizen, you can get free health care. You don't have to buy health care. You don't have to pay taxes. And you can vote because we're not going to be forced to check your ID. A federal court has ruled against a Texas law that would require voters to present photo IDs to election officials before being allowed to, to cast ballots in November. Now, Bonnie, and you know from our church, Bonnie and Roy, or as we affectionately call them, Bonnie and Clyde, they, uh, they've been coming to church here for a few years. They are downstairs right now eating lunch that I fed them, that I bought for them, but they come here at, They come here all the time and they duplicate DVDs. You ought to see them. I mean, we've got, I don't know, like 20,000 DVD duplicators going, not that many really. But anyway, they're down there all the time. They're down there right now getting our watchers packets ready. And Bonnie and Roy have for years participated in, um, in voting, they go to a voting, uh, a polling place, and they they work as as election people. They say, "Here, sign here. Here's your ballot." That's what they do. And every time I go to my polling place, which is just maybe a mile and a half down the road from where I live, it's right on my way to the church. I stop there. I I know that I have to do one thing. I have to pull out my driver's license, and I have to present my driver's license. You know what I ought to do next time? Just to kick it up a notch. I ought to, see, I've got, I've got two government identifications. One is a driver's license. One is a concealed carry license. I think next time I go to the voting booth, I'll show them the concealed carry. No, 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 I probably won't do that. But anyway, when I go to my polling place, in rural, that's hard to say, in rural Jefferson County, I don't live in the city limits, I live out of town. When I go to my polling place in an area that is sparsely populated, I have to show my ID. I have to give them proof that I am a valid human being citizen of the United States of America. That's what I have to do. And the Supreme Court says, uh, that's voter disenfranchisement. I mean, somebody might not be allowed to vote. Are you kidding me? See, I get it. I know what this is about. Three-judge panel in Washington ruled Thursday that the law imposes strict, unforgiving burdens on the poor. And noted that racial minorities in Texas are more likely to live in poverty. I think this should go to the Supreme Court is what I think. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. 
West Nile virus causes cases rise 40% in one week. U.S. health officials say West Nile virus cases are up 40% since last week and are on pace to rival the record uh, years of 2002-2003. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has and that's interesting. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Oh, I get that. I get that. Let's not have any diseases. Let's let's fix it to where mankind never has another disease. I think I understand that. Has confirmed 1,590 cases of mosquito. That's how my son-in-law from Kenya says it, mosquito. Cases of the mosquito-borne disease and 66 deaths so far this year. Half of the cases are in Texas. You know what you do, Texas? When them mosquitoes bite you, you bite back. Come on, you're Texans for crying out loud. What's wrong with you? Health officials think cases uh, have peaked or are peaking now, but likely will continue through October. By the way, did you hear about the mosquito that bit Chuck Norris? It turned into Chuck Norris. Can you believe that? Anyway... Um, I have got, uh, oh, Hurricane Isaac. I've got a little thing I wanted to, to share with you today, a little Bible study on Hurricane Isaac. I recorded the Watchman video broadcast for next week, this morning, and I think it came out good. And I dealt with Hurricane Isaac and the symbolism of it. Um, and I, I'll go ahead and tell you guys. But you guys have to keep it a big hush-hush secret. You can't tell anybody what I'm going to tell you. Um, it's going to come out in the Watchman video broadcast next week. There is, are you listen to this now, catch this. There is a 9-11 connection with this hurricane. I am, I'm, I am dead. That's what, that's what got me going to do this Watchman, because I was going to do this, the thing on the... Um, on the Olympic closing ceremony, and I'm still got that in the queue. Uh, but there is a 9/11 connection with this hurricane, and you'll see it in n next week's Watchman video broadcast. But I want to deal with a, a subject that's kind of related to that, because I had talked about this on Tuesday. I talked about the idea of of the dec the southern decadence thing that's going on in in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana right now. Neither rain nor shine nor uh, cold and sleet will prevent the sodomites from sodomizing one another in Sodom land. There is no hurricane that can hold them back. And, and my take on this, and I dealt with this Tuesday, and I said it again in the Watchman broadcast this morning, uh, the idea that these people are so bent on doing this thing that they're going to be doing in New Orleans, Louisiana. They're not going to let what is, to me, the clear hand of God stop them. They're, they're basically saying, God, you cannot stop us. You cannot keep us from doing this. And if they think that way, listen to me. If the sodomite of America thinks that way about God, who do you think you are? And your little voting block or your conservative politicians or anything, you're not going to stop them. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. The, the sodomite agenda is going to continue, and it's going to go and move forward and gain ground and gain political pressure. And it's going to do that until America is in flames like Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, I am, I'm hearing from you folk in Niederland that you cannot preach or speak out against in a public forum anywhere against sodomy or sodomites. You can't do it. Am I, am I right on that? Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting yes, 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 yes. You can't do that. Wow. And that's coming to America. Um, but to me, the significance of the Hurricane Isaac that made landfall at exactly on exactly the same day in the same place seven years from Hurricane Katrina. Um, and this one was only a Category 1 hurricane, which means it didn't have the really strong winds that Katrina had. Katrina was a Category 5. I mean, this was a big, bad, nasty woman hurricane. 
and Isaac is like her little brother moving in. Uh, it was a slow moving storm, and by the way, it is headed to our top secret broadcasting bunker here at, in uh, 1233 American Legion Drive. It's headed here by Friday afternoon, Friday evening, and all day Saturday, and we're going, woo! We finally get some rain, man, because we're like a foot and a half shy of, of having normal rainfall this year. And so we're just looking for, we're just watching for the rain. We're going, yeah, bring it on. But anyway, could, um, Isaac is a slow-moving rainmaker is what it is. And what has happened in New Orleans and the, and the bayous and the swamps, that's a very swampy area down there, is that it is flooding. New Orleans, in case you don't know, here is sea level and here is New Orleans. And New Orleans is right next to the sea. And so there's like a wall holding the ocean back. And when Katrina came in, the walls went tumbling down and the ocean moved in. And now the ocean is falling down upon New Orleans and all those low-lying areas, and it's flaying them out. And I was thinking about that today, and I want you to see the symbolism of this here. Uh, because I've taught and think of as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Think about that. Think about that idea. Think about what the Bible says that floods and waves represent. Let me read some verses here. Psalm 18:4. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the listen to this, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. So here is the symbolism language of the Bible, and the Bible will always always tell you what the symbol means. If the Bible says, oh, here's a rock, well, the Bible's going to tell you what that rock is. You don't need to go looking everywhere else. The Bible will tell you what the rock is. And so the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. There, there is a flood of iniquity and ungodly men rising up above the level of Christianity, especially in this country, we are being flooded, we are being overflowed with ungodliness in this nation. Think about the ramifications of it. Psalm 32, verse 6, For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him think about it. And you know what? I'm going to go to the context. Psalm 32 just happens to be one of my favorite places in the Bible. I love it. Um, the Bi Oh, look at verse 5. If you're in Psalm 32, look at verse 5. I acknowledge my sin unto thee. It's about sin. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in the time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. That is the sinfulness, the ramifications of sin. And I want to tell you something, Christian. Um, you can get you can get overwhelmed with sin. You can get overwhelmed with sinfulness. You can kind of get back on God a little bit. Cry out to him. Call unto him. Do what David did. Acknowledge your sin. He didn't say go around looking for everybody else's. Acknowledge your sin. By the way, I would like to see just one time um, in case you don't know, there's some people out on YouTube that do not like Mike Hoggard. And I, I'm fine with that. Uh, and, and I watch what they say. I want to hear what's being said. Um, because I listen even to the critics. I listen to what people say. I think I have an obligation to do that. Um, but there are some out there that are just brutal and they're mean. And just one time I would like to hear some of these people say, uh, let me tell you what's wrong with me. Let me tell you how messed up I am. I mean, I know Mike Hoggart's messed up, but let me, let me tell you about me. Let me tell you what's wrong with me. And I think the greatest thing that any born-again Bible-believing Christian has is a, a, a self-personal awareness of their own iniquity and their own transgressions. An idea that they know full well what they're capable of. I know, I know me. I know what I can do. 
Okay, I know what I can do. I know what my flesh is capable of. Thank God for the Spirit of God that prevents it. But I, I know what's in me, and I'm going to deal with that here in a minute. Um, and I promise to get to your emails, and I, I know I'm just rambling, but I, I just want you to, I, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and in mine iniquity have I not hid. And I'm telling you, born-again, Bible-believing Christian, the best thing that you've got going for you is an honest attitude about your own sinfulness. Your, your, your honest to goodness to you, you know who you are, and you know what Christ has done in you. Um, Psalm 93, 3, the floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods have lifted up their waves. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the Aquarian symbol, the two waves representing the kingdoms, one from below and one from above. I want you to think about that. The, the floods, lift, the, the, when you hear the newagers talk about the uh, the waves how waves change the frequencies of your dna you can you need the you need the waves to change your dna when you hear the newagers when you hear people like beth moore and you hear people like patricia king and these others talking about how you need to get in tune with god how you need to have the new transmissions coming in and you need to get god's dna when you hear talk like that red flags are going up and you're going wait a minute i think i know what this is where this is headed um, Isaiah 28, 2, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and a strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. Isaiah 28 is that passage where it's here a little, there a little, and the drunkards of Ephraim. Isaiah 59, 19, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. Notice how the Bible constantly is talking about your sin. It's talking about ungodly men. The enemy, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. Listen to what the Bible is telling us. The Aquarian age symbol is dead on. And what they're telling you we're headed toward. We're headed to a flood similar to the days of Noah. But God promised he would not flood the earth with water anymore. But there is a flood of the enemy coming in. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob saith the Lord. Isaiah 59, 19, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy shall come in like a... Did I just read that already? Yeah, I did. I pasted it twice. What an idiot. Jeremiah 47, 2, Thus saith... Can I call myself an idiot without making somebody mad? Okay. Jeremiah 47, 2, And it does. It makes... There's... Somebody has written me said, Pastor Mike, when you, you keep talking to yourself like, you know, you're a bad person. You're not. Well... In the spirit of God, I'm not, okay? But And I'm going to deal with something here in a minute. Jeremiah 47, 2, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, waters rise up out of the north. Think about that, the north. The UN video we did. It shall be an overflowing flood and shall overflow the land and all that there is therein. The city and them that dwell therein. The men shall cry and all the inhabitants of the land shall have. Isn't that sad? The men shall cry. It's sad when men cry. And then Luke chapter 6, verse 48, he is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. See, you know the Bible and you know what the rock is. I will build my church on this rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it. Listen to me, Bible-believing, born-again Christian. The floods are going to come. They already do in your life, but they have not destroyed your house. You know why? It's built on a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not, listen to that one. You got to hear and do. Heareth and doeth not is like a man that without foundation built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. You ponder that for a while. I've got a, um, 
somebody sent me a video. I want to run through this very uh, rapido. Um, it's uh, one of these big, they need a whole basketball arena thing to have this conference. And uh, it's one of these new age charismatic gods, you know, going to give us a revolution conferences with all these in these women speakers. Ain't right. Ain't right. Um, and so anyway, I wanted to show you this and I want you to look at some of the lingo and some of the things that they're saying in this. Um, and by the way, it's not for free. They don't charge you an arm and a leg to go get the revolution that they're in. It's like, well, God gave it to us, but we want like 65 bucks from you to get it. Does it not occur to anybody that if it's for sale, it's, well, anyway, you take a look at the video. John 151, launching you into See an the extreme symbol? encounter with God. Featuring Jason Upton. Dennis Rainier. When we get a revelation of our identity and our inheritance, it gives us this awesome freedom to just be who we are in Jesus Christ. And the reality is that when we are just who we are and we're not trying to be somebody else, there's power in that to change the atmosphere. Don Potter. He's Stacy Campbell. Because I know a God in Israel. I know a God in heaven. I know his kingdom is within me, and I am a manifester of that kingdom. Sean Smith, Tammy Rainier, and Elizabeth A. Nixon, plus films by Darren Wilson and Jonathan Nixon. August 23rd through 25th, Comerica Theater, Phoenix. Register now at john151.com. John 151, Revival, Reformation, Revolution. Revel, uh, you know what that is. Reformation and revolution. Those are all new age terms being used now. You'll not find you'll not find revolution in the King James Bible. You will find reformation. And the time of reformation was was uh, talked about, and, and we we dealt with that here recently. The time of Reformation was when God was going to reform from the old covenant to the new covenant. He was going to, he's going to change covenants here. Now we have a new contract here. <clears throat> and that was all done in Christ. And I picked up on some things that the chick said. The female who was definitely not silent. She was not being obedient to the Lord. And she talked about, and I don't know if you picked up on this in watching it, she talked about the angels of God ascending and descending. And I'm going, yeah, I've heard that before. Genesis 28, 12, and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. A ladder. And when I dealt with this in the DNA video, I, I get it. I think I know what that is. And then John chapter 1, verse 49, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now correct me if I'm wrong. But in this little video clip, it looked like she was saying that that belongs to you now. The angel is of God. Heaven's going to be open to you constantly, and you're going to have angels of God ascending and descending on you. And I'm going, I think I get it. I think I know what's going on here. It's a, it's a subtle reference to the New Age, New World Order, biggest mother of all secrets thing where they're going to alter man's. It's all about your DNA. And then she said, she was pointing at her belly, which is not as large as mine. But anyway, and she was talking about the, the kingdom. It's, it's in you. It's going to come out of you. It's in you. And I've told you to watch for this kind of talk out of, out of these people. Oh, it's, it's God's on the inside of you. You need to connect to the God on the inside of you. 
it, and I understand, let me read a verse here that talks about the kingdom of God uh, being inside of you. Listen to this, Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Uh, the Bible says, when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, let me explain biblically, I, and, and you need to understand something. If the teaching that you're receiving is coming from an unbiblical source, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a woman subverting or usurping the authority of men in a public congregation, then don't trust the teaching. Don't trust it. Because God did not inspire the teaching. So you add to this verse, Luke 17, you add to this verse, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell rich in, in you richly. The kingdom of God and the word of Christ dwelling in you. It is in you. Thy word have I hid in my heart. The kingdom of God is through his word. But this is not, and you know this, when you watch stuff like this, you know that this is going to have this much to do with the Bible and this much to do with signs, wonders, and awakening, kundalini, shaktipat, speaking in sprechens of Deutsch and all that. It's going to have everything to do with that stuff. Manifestations everywhere. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. He said, all goes together, lady, who was teaching this. You're trying to teach me, you're trying to teach me about the kingdom of God, but your role when the word of God richly dwells in you, you understand that it's not your role to be standing up there teaching these men. And so you don't trust it. Now, let me um, let me read this to you. Because yes, yes, absolutely. To a Christian born-again believer, a true Bible-believing born-again Christian, you have the Word of God, you have Jesus dwelling in you, in your spirit. There's something else in there, and it's no good. You understand what I'm saying? Let me read the scriptures, Romans chapter 7. This is that beautiful, beautiful chapter in the Bible that gives comfort and mercy and grace to every born-again child of God who, when they accept God's plan of salvation, are born again, they still have something in them that they don't like. They want it out. Romans seven nineteen. This is what the Apostle Paul said concerning his present life. For the good that I would do not, but for the good that I would, that's a will word. He, his will is to do good. In his spirit, he wants to constantly do nothing but good. For the, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would, which is will, not, that I do. You see, you thought that you were abnormal when you still had a bad thought or whatever. Verse 20. Now, if I do... That I would not. And by the way, let me stop right here. Just to clarify anybody's misunderstanding. If you sin as a born again Christian, repent. That message is so clear in the scriptures. I don't know. I don't see how anybody gets away from that. If you sin as a born again Bible believing Christian in your flesh, repent get it out of there now if I do that I would not it is no more I that do it but sin notice what he says sin that dwelleth in me 
sin that dwelleth in me. That's present tense. I find in a law that, I, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, especially this one. The tongue is the most evil of all human members. The book of James says so. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And I want to back up to verse 18 of Romans chapter 7. And I want you to look at how Paul describes what's in him. He said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh. And he's, he, he separates out his flesh being from his spirit. His soul is connected to his spirit, in, and which is connected to God's spirit, which his soul will live forever. And he recognizes that. And his, his soul, his innermost being, his will is toward God always. But his flesh... It's bad. So he says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in your 46 chromosomes, in your blood, in your muscles and everything, dwelleth, and I like it. Here's what he calls it. No good thing. No good thing. He's calling what's dwelling in him no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. I did a search in the King James Bible of the phrase, no good thing. You listen, you listen to this. You're going to remember keeping in mind that that no good thing is sin that dwelleth in him. It's the man of sin. It's like the seed of the, of the beast that's in our physical bodies right now. Now I want you to listen. Psalm 8411. You write this down. You're going to like this. It's, it describes how God deals with no good thing. I love this. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Did you see that? No good thing will he. He's going to withhold the no good thing from them that walk uprightly. I love that. Uh, let me read another one here. Psalm 4, 4, stand in awe and sin not, commune with your own. Oh, no, that's related to something else. I had, thought I had another verse here. Anyway, I don't. All right. That's my little Bible study du jour. Let me, um, let me deal with your emails today. Coming in, your emails. This is from Bert. And, uh, oh, you're kidding me. My son, somebody check on this. My son just sent me a text message and said, I'm not making this up. It says, Bill Nye died. Somebody look that up. Somebody check, no way. Dun, dun, dun. If that's true, somebody look that up. All right. Anyway, while I wait for this. Uh, Bert, hey Bert, writes in, um, and he says, and this is kind of odd. I'm not sure exactly how to take this, but I'm going to answer it the best I can. Bert, which is it, the Word of God or the Constitution of the United States or both? I don't know. It being what we are to have faith in. Thank you, and may God bless you, Pastor Mike. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, Bert, so if you're watching, help me out here. But I, here's maybe what I think you're getting at. Um, oh, it's a hoax. Okay. Thank you. Bill Nye is not dead. Thank you, all you faithful watchers out there. Okay. Anyway, 
Well, that would have been just like super weird, wouldn't it? Anyway, it's a it's a Twitter hoax. It's not real. All right, all right, Bert, back to you. Which is it, the Word of God, or the Constitution, of the United States, or both? And I don't know if you're referencing. I did uh, watch a video broadcast here a while back called uh, "A Breach of Contract," and I t and I have used this analogy before in dealing with uh, the teaching on principalities from Ephesians chapter six. I make reference to the Constitution of the United States because laws. The laws of mankind are written and should be written down in ink on paper and not you. So you can't just peel them off and say, what law that law was or so that an, any official of any law of any government cannot just willy nilly do whatever they want to do and say, well, I'm arresting you. What for? You're ugly. Well, there's no law against that. There's no law against being ugly. And so I think, Bert, I don't have faith in the Constitution, but it is God gave mankind the ability to rule over himself with written laws. Anytime you have a situation where laws are not written down and agreed upon, you have a dictatorship is what you have. Saddam Hussein did whatever. He killed whatever he wanted to kill. He, he, his sons... His sons raped, molested, murdered, you name it. There is a story about one of Saddam Hussein's sons who, coming out of his hotel room, saw a bride and a groom headed to their hotel room. And the son of Saddam Hussein grabbed that girl, killed her husband, raped her, killed her. There should be laws written down. And so I accept the Constitution as the valid law of the United States because it's written down. My analogy of that is I think that the things that come from God should be written down and they already are. So I, I hope that helps you, Bert. Um, Adam, he says, your recent videos, which Bible you be the judge, have been noticeably less strong on your have been noticeably less strong on your stance on the KJV. Uh, you seem to have offered up the word of God as more of a personal opinion of yours rather than absolute unapologetic truth. Uh, the KJV issue is I'm gonna read I'm gonna read it out before I comment. The KJV issue KJV issue is one that pertains to salvation because faith only comes by hearing the real word of God. Those who have believed in Jesus from a false Bible have trusted the Antichrist as their savior because they are not the they are not the shepherd's voice. Jesus taught in John ten that his sheep hear his voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow because they know not the voice of strangers. All the other voices which are the false Bibles and false prophets are the idle shepherds that come to steal, kill and destroy. If someone does not believe and know what the shepherd's voice is, then they are not saved according to Jesus. A Adam, I appreciate you saying that. Um, however, and, and, and you are, you're welcome to your opinion. You, if you watched all three of the videos, um, here's, here's what the intention, my intention was, whether it came out this way or not, what my intention of uh, uh, doing these videos, number one, it was, it was, I was going to just redo the which Bible video. And in that one, it's a, you know, one and a half hour thing where I just quickly lay this out and say, you need to believe this. You need to believe this. And I think I did that in all three of these because I expanded it and I went into a lot more detail. And I'm making an appeal to people. That's what preachers do. Now, if you don't think that I strongly, strongly support, endorse, defend, stand up for the King James Bible, I can't help you with that. I think I'm doing everything I can to do exactly that. But I'm talking in in this set of in this set of videos, I am trying to reach people who right now don't don't know that it's an issue or they have they have been taught like I used to be taught that you know it's all Bibles and they all mis they're all mistakes and they're all this and that and the other and you KJV only people you're all wackos you're idol worshippers and that I tried to logically and and um, in a very straightforward manner lay out 
lay out the evidence of why I believe what I believe and an enjoyment for you to at least come to a place where you're going to decide which Bible it is. And I think, Adam, out of fairness to me, out of the testimony of the last, let's say the last 10 years of my preaching, my ministry, my personal life, I think that everything that I have ever said in the, at least the last 10 years of my ministry, going a little bit farther than that, has been to tell people, you need to get the King James Bible. You need to read it. You need to believe it. You need to study it. You need to memorize it. It is the source of your salvation. It is the Word of God. I think in thinking everything that I've ever said says that. And um, I don't... It, um, you said noticeably less strong on your stance on the KJV. You seem to offer it up. The Word of God is more of a personal opinion of yours rather than absolute unapologetic. No, I... I I, Adam, I respectfully disagree with that statement because I laid out every speck of evidence that I had. Most of that evidence was contained within the scriptures itself of why I believe what I believe. But I just simply said, you're going to have to make a choice. If you go back and listen, I believe that you will hear me say, you're going to have to make a choice. You need to make a choice. Now, if you choose the vine of Sodom over here, that's your business. But I think you ought to choose the vine of Christ. You go back and listen, Adam. And I think that that's what you're going to hear. Um, now, I, I want to say this. and um, Don't judge Mike Hoggard after listening to one video. Don't judge me that way. And there are people who are sitting out there right now, and I've made mention of this. You've watched one video and went, wow, Mike Hoggard's so cool. Here's what I want you. I want everybody to do this. I want you to go back and start watching everything that I've said, everything I've preached, everything I've taught. Now, if there's something that I, I last night I had to correct myself. I taught something a few weeks ago that was clearly wrong in Scripture, and I corrected myself. I do that from time to time. But out of fairness to me and out of fairness to what, what I'm trying to do, Go listen to a, a lifetime of what's in here and what's in my heart um, before you make a decision on what you think I what you think I am. Um, this is Tracy from Philly. Hi, Pastor Mike. Here's an article around your neck of the woods. Stay safe. Uh, let me pull this up very quickly. Heartland farmer, a new Heartland virus discovered in sick Missouri farmers. Two men in Missouri who became severely ill after sustaining tick bites were found to be infected with a new type of virus. Ooh, that's, see, I don't, there's a reason. I go into the woods after the first frost because, number one, I don't like tick bites. Number two, I am badly allergic to poison ivy. I mean, it's it's terrible in me. And so I just stay out of the woods, and I recommend everybody else, too. Uh, Pastor Mike here. Um, this is from a guy named Randy. He says, Mike speaks against tongues or is uncertain. No. Please go to godsaidmansaid.com and examine closely the study by our church. Randy, I'm not. I'm not going to. I don't need to. And Randy says, I fear Mike is wrong in this area. I do enjoy much of what Mike says, and I appreciate that, Randy. I really do. But don't always agree. You don't have to. Why would God give something to the church only to take it away? Here's, Randy, let me help you here. God didn't take it away. God doesn't just take something away and not give you something better than that. You see, God had prophets all over the New Testament. They're like the multiple stars in the night sky. They're absolutely beautiful. I love to look at stars. Those prophets, many prophets. You read uh, Hebrews 11. God who at sundry time and divers past spake unto us by his servants, the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Notice the prophets, plural, and son, singular. 
It's because at night, all those stars represent all those prophets because we're in darkness. But the, the stars, I mean, they, they're beautiful. And then all of a sudden, something happens and the stars are going away and we're going, what, what's happening? What's happening to my stars? I love my stars. And then here comes the sun of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. One, one great light to shine on mankind. And you go, whoa, this is better. And my point is, God didn't just take it away. He gave us something better than all these unknown tongues that you are afraid that I'm wrong in. Um, God is the same yesterday, today, forever, and he would not take the gifts of the Spirit from the bride, for the saints need all the help they can get. And exactly. And my point is, you know what? I was going to do this as a watchman broadcast. I haven't done it. The gifts of the Spirit are right here. They're all right, every one of them. Every one of the gifts of the Spirit are right here in the pages of this book. And, I, and I'm sorry you don't believe that. But, Randy, if you came to me and said, I have a prophecy from God, I'm going to go to my Bible and say, show me what page it's on. I'm not going to believe you. Uh, Barb says, what is the connection between Agenda 21 and the sustainable map? And what is your suggestion for Christians to prepare? Agenda, I, I keep wanting to look into that, and I, and I haven't. The time has just failed me. But Agenda 21 and the su sustainable maps and all this stuff, there is a pastor's wife that uh, I know of down in Arkansas. She works very heavily in this area of rewilding and the UN taking control of of wetlands and UN taking control of farmland and UN taking control of major areas in the United States and I I personally think I personally think based upon what I've seen so far that there is an active agenda to remove practically most everybody out of the heart of America I mean I know that sounds weird but I think there is. There always already is UN control over lands and areas in the United States that we have no we have no say so. We have no control over, we have no authority over whatsoever. And I believe wholeheartedly in that agenda. And I think I've explained this from uh, from the scriptures that the earth is a woman and this the Gaia she's a she's a nasty woman. She's bloodthirsty, I know that. She drank Abel's blood. And um, she doesn't like a man standing on her, having authority, having dominion over her. She's Jezebel. And so I clearly see a connection between the environmental movement, the sustainability idea, Agenda 21, and all this stuff, with the idea that man does not belong on the earth. We should turn it back over to the deer and to the ticks and to the mosquitoes and everybody else. And so I see that as an active agenda. Um, and you're asking, what is my suggestion for Christians to prepare? Number one, pray. Number two, read your Bible. See how simple that is? You thought I was going to tell you to stock food. I mean, you can if you want to. Um, but it, it won't work. Prayer, Bible reading. Prayer and Bible reading. Adam, let's see here. Adam... You have, uh, I don't know, maybe this is a different Adam. Adam, the people out there who do not believe in the rapture are just showing a complete lack of understanding. It simply is a man-made term, an accurate one, too, that describes the doctrine found in 1 Thessalonians 4. I agree with that. Matthew 24, I agree with that. Uh, Mark 13, got it. 1 Corinthians 15, there. Um, Revelation 6 and 7, mm, I'm still on the fringe on that one. But anyway, I mean, it simply is another term for the second coming of Christ in the first scripture reference I gave, which says, under the coming of the Lord. Okay? Anyway. Tracy! How you doing, Tracy? Question. The first fruits of the land are to go to God at the altar, and worship is given unto God, Deuteronomy 26, 10 through 11. I do not attend a physical church anymore, so where do I bring the first fruits to? Uh, question number two, I'll watch your broadcast, all of them, and now am bringing my tithes to the altar at your church. Can I be a member of your church or say that Bethel Church is my home even though I live in, uh, can you live, no. Listen, if you said somewhere in America, yeah, but Canada, pff, forget, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it represents a, a conflict of interest. If I were to tell you that, 
Tracy, I think you ought to tithe here. That's what I think. I cannot tell you that. I cannot in good conscience tell you that. I cannot. It's a conflict of interest. It would be seen as wrong, and I'm not going to do it. Okay? Now, I believe that a Christian, by, his, by, by the Spirit of God in you, should at least tithe, if not give more. And I believe that. I believe strongly in it. Um, my recommendation to you is to find a worthy ministry, and there are others. There are others besides us. There are other, other worthy churches. And you ask God what to do with that. Now, that being said, question two, um, can I be a member of your church? Uh, in, in name, yes. Um, and if you remember, and you know what? We still haven't done it. I've just been so busy with everything else. Um, we, we are redoing our, our church membership roles now. And you probably, if you have not heard my idea on church membership, I'm not big on, Hey, now sign here and you're a church member. I'm not big on that because some people take that. Well, I, I'm a member of a certain church and uh, yeah, yeah. And they'll use that to try to get into heaven. Say, God, here's my card. Uh, I think it's ridiculous. And some people actually believe that. Uh, but anyway, um, our, our official membership role of names who are classified as members, we, we have to do this because we have a form of government that's congregational government. In other words, there are certain issues that the church gets to decide to do. Like when we redid our carpet, the church said, let's, yeah, let's do this. Um, they don't get to tell me now, Pastor Mike, we voted that you can't preach this somewhere. They don't do that. But on certain issues that relate to the corporation, let's say, of our church, uh, we are congregational, and so we have to have a membership role. And we limit that to locally attending people, people who can get here from Sunday to Sunday. So... I would never send you a sheet of paper saying, sign here, and we'll try to get you into the membership role. That's not a good idea because then just anybody from anywhere in the world can get on our membership role. And let's say that a group of them said, you know what, we're going to get rid of Mike Hoggard. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, but if you want to go around telling the whole world, you know what, I'm a member of Bethel Church. Now, if you say that, Tracy, and you ask me to be your pastor, Here's what you're saying, that you are coming under the authority of the Word of God through Bethel Church is what you're saying. And you need to treat yourself and your own personal life just like I would expect anybody here in this church to treat their own personal life and their own dealings and things like that. In other words, if you're going to go around saying, I'm part of Bethel Church, if you put that bumper sticker on your car, you make sure that you're not flipping people off going down the road. All right. Anyway, Dan, how you doing, Dan? Dan says, Pastor Mike, you may have talked about this before, but can you go over John 3.22 and John 4.12? Did Jesus only baptize his disciples? I don't know how to explain these verses. Uh, let's see here. John, you, boy, you just never know what somebody's going to ask. John 3.22 says, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized them. And then John chapter 4, verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that, that Jesus made and had baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Okay, I get it. I, I, I think the uh, question you asked, did Jesus only baptize his disciples? I don't know how to explain these verses. I think that the misunderstanding here is in verse 2 of chapter 4, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, and if you can pardon me to clear this up, did. In other words, Jesus never took them and went, in the name of the Father, Son, and Jesus did not do the physical act of baptizing them. His disciples did under his, uh, under his leadership, under his authority, if that makes sense to you. So Jesus never physically baptized, I would say not even his disciples, um, and I can tell you that there is no, uh, concerning water baptism, there's nothing in the scripture that prohibits um, either a pastor, deacon, an elder in the church, uh, some male of the church. Uh, Brady and Bradley, uh, they baptize their dad, but they are not ordained as ministers uh, of our church, and, but that's allowable in the scripture. 
And so I think the I think the thing is um, that um, uh, Jesus did not physically touch them and baptize them, but his disciples did. All right, Patty. How you doing, Patty? Pastor Hoggard, with great fear, I listened to the Bible study this morning. I didn't want you to be afraid. Man, I don't want you to be scared. I have followed Bethel Church Ministries for more than a year, stung by some of the teachings. But I followed your advice. Open the word, open the word, open the word. Wait, listen, and sooner or later you, ant- you're, you answered the question. Uh, oh, God, help me to ask this question right. I escaped home seven years ago amidst a violent situation. Church attending husband said he had complete control over the wife's body and mind. Thus, my fear of your teaching today. My question is about divorce. I stayed 35 years for my son's sake. Affairs and the use of... Wow. This, I'm not going to read part of this. Forgiving is one thing, she says. But repeated abuse is another. Uh, thank you for the teachings on godly women's role. I tried to be a godly wife, and God has forgiven me where I wasn't. Now I know why God kept saying, wait. And I'm glad I waited for your teaching today in Christ, Patty. (sighs) Patty, I I, I will tell you that, uh, yes, God hates divorce. And I'm reading here what you said here. And I I can tell you that, uh, praise the Lord that you got out of a situation like that. Um, Now, there is a really, really good sermon on divorce that, and um, I have, there's there's so many scriptures on divorce, and and in some cases in my mind, they seem contradictory. And so that's why I have not really just done a, just a, this is the word of God teaching on divorce. Let me say this, because there are severe restrictions on divorce and what a person can do after divorce from the Bible. Pastor Reg Kelly preaches a good sermon on it. I think I agree with, I have to go less and again to say I would agree with everything that he said, but I, I know Reg and I know where his heart is. And he closes it with a lot of grace. But I can tell you, Patty, and anybody else that's ever been divorced, and I in our church, there are, you're looking at the back heads of numerous people that have been divorced and remarried. God makes all things new. God is the one who can forgive even bad marriages or mistakes. I just thank God that I've never had to go get a divorce lawyer. But I never use the fact that I'm not divorced as a weapon against anybody to say, oh, you're divorced, get out. I can't do that. And and Brother Reg doesn't do that either, by the way. So I I would encourage you to go listen to his message. It's it's pretty good. And uh, I was recommended to buy, it was recommended to me by someone who had been divorced and remarried, all right? Uh, And Patty, I thank you for that. And I hope that this whole teaching on women, I, I hope that it's a blessing and not a curse to anybody that watches. Tracy. Uh, says, hello, Pastor Mike, we've been out of our church for months due to a doctrinal error. We feel like we are supposed to be in a church, but God has not shown us where to go. Are we okay just watching online for now? Also, we pulled my daughter out of public school for religious reasons and, now, and new agendas that are coming into the schools. That's what we did with Caleb. Uh, just wonder what you thought about homeschooling. Uh, thank you for being my pastor from afar. You and your church are a godsend. Bless you all. And Tracy, what I'm going to tell you is, is that um, you are... I mean, there are hundreds of people, I don't know how many people out there that call Bethel their church. Now, I will say this to everybody that's listening to me, and I don't, I don't, I'm just going to pretend I don't know anybody and and know anything about you. What I'm going to tell you is, is that some of you out there, and I've said this before, some of you out there, you're just rebellious and you're, you're, there's just something, there's something wrong with you. You don't go to any church and you're proud of the fact that you don't go to man-made churches. There's something wrong with you. If, if you have rebelled, and you, you, in other words, you sit in a church, and you start dissecting and nitpicking everything that every church is doing, and say, well, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right. And you say, well, there are just no more churches anymore. I would pray about your attitude. However, having said that, 
if if you're of a number of people who in your area you will not sit under NIVs, New American Standard, Message Bible. You will not sit and listen to rock and roll music. You will not participate in the tongues or the signs and wonders. You just won't do that stuff. Then welcome to Bethel. This is why we're doing what we're doing. To give you at least a pastor's leadership in your life. And you can choose me or not choose me. It's your choice. I'm not making you sit, uh, be quiet in church now. I'm having church. I don't, you know, you can turn it off if you want to. But I do recommend that if Bethel is going to be your church, then I, I tell you just like I told the other lady, make sure that your life matches the word of God. All right. Andrea, hi, Pastor. As Christians, are we really followers of Christ if we do not sell all we have and give it away to the poor? I'm afraid of being like the rich man who would not give up all to follow Jesus. On the other hand, maybe it's different in this day. Well, here's the thing. Um, there are all kinds of things in the New Testament. The Bible is teaching us how to live righteously, how to live right, how to, how to run businesses. The Bible teaches us how to, how, to, how to deal with our money and the things that we have. Um, Jesus told this rich young ruler this thing because, number one, the kid lied to him. He said, I've kept all the commandments. Jesus knew he was lying through his teeth. He said, okay, do this one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and then come and be my disciple. And Jesus knew his heart. He knew he wasn't going to do that. And I don't have a, a full and complete understanding of that, but I don't see any other place in the scripture where we are enjoined or commanded to absolutely give up every right to everything we have, hand it over to poor people and live as paupers for the rest of our life for the sake of Christ. I don't see that in the scripture. All right. Um, and I'm going to have to pray about that and, and get a good, clear, concise teaching on what exactly Jesus was getting across here. But he specifically said it to this one person here who knew he was lying through his teeth. I, Jesus, I kept all the commandments. Oh, really? Well, how about this one? And he, cause he knew he wouldn't do it. He knew that he wouldn't do it. And by the way, um, you're a follower of Christ if you believe what he said. You believe what the whole counsel of God says. That makes you a follower of Christ. Uh, Tanya, Pastor Mike, thank you for showing us how to study the Bible by studying its numbers. I'm working on some children's Bible lessons for church. was looking at the number 39. I also found this. Guilt in all its forms is 39 times. Isn't that something? Because that's how many books are in the, New, in the Old Testament. Romans uh, three nineteen. Now we have. Uh, now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth be stopped, and, and all the world may become guilty before God. Tanya, you get it because when I when I would see number occurrences in the Bible, in order to make sure that I'm following the Scripture, I would look for how that word was used in relation to what I thought the theme would be, and and you nailed it. Because it's telling you that the law brings guilt. And that's why all the forms of the word guilt 39 times. You got it. Good going, sis. Lynn, repentance. How does repentance work? Is it just something you do or does God have to do it in you? How do you know it's real? The answer to that, Lynn, is yes. Moving right along. No, I won't move right along. The answer to that is yes. It is something that you do. It is something that God does in you. The Holy Ghost's job, according to uh, John 16, he's to reprove the world of sin. The job of the Holy, here's what happens in a true Bible-believing, born-again Christian. Someone who has the, 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 new, the new will, as it were, that Paul talked about. We have this thing in us that when we sin, the Holy Ghost is going, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. That, that's wrong. That's wicked. That's wrong. And the Holy Ghost begins our conscience. We know we did it. Our own conscience is witnessing against it, going, you did it, you did it, you did it, you did it, you did it. Kind of like Edgar Allan's pose, the telltale heart. Boom, 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 boom. You did it, you did it, you did it. And what happens? Some, some little bad thing happens at home, at work, at school, or whatever, and we're just going, God... Oh, I know, I know. I'm sorry, God. 
repentance. Godly, uh, here's, here's how the Bible says it. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Repentance is based upon sorrow for what you've done. Now I'm going to ask you, and this is a, you know, this is a pretty straightforward question. Your child that does something wrong, my kid, my child, Caleb, bless his heart. Caleb does something wrong. He knows he's made dad mad, mom mad. He'll come, I mean, just out of the blue. Sorry, dad. But I'll tell you what, I just wipe tears. and For your kids to come to you and say they're sorry, that's like manna from heaven. Think of how God sees it. For one of his children to come to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm trying real hard. I need help. You got it. Amen. You got it. Christoph. Hi, Pastor Mike. Some Christians who use the KJV believe that the Bible teaches geocentrism rather than heliocentrism. Have you looked into this? It seems that some verses do lean toward geocentrism in the Bible. I was wondering if maybe you could look into that and make a video about it. Thanks. I, yeah, I get it. And let me explain what this is. Geocentrism is the idea that the earth is at the center. Centrism, geo, is at the center of the whole universe. Geocentrism also teaches that the earth does not move now and heliocentrism says that everything revolves around the sun now every scientist in the whole world says heliocentrism galileo i think was it newton or galileo one of the two changed the whole world catholic church hates his gods I, a guy sent me a book years ago on it and i'm going oh come on what are you flat earth what's wrong with you and I didn't want to read what this guy said. I looked right for, see, God changed my heart. I'm looking for scriptures now. And I'm just reading the scriptures. The guys, and he's, it was King James, the, what he laid out in, up from the scriptures. And you know what? I'll just say this. Joshua did not command the earth to stand still. You go think about that for a while. And, and Christoph, just out of, out of fairness, okay, I, I mean, I think I do. I think I am geocentric. But the thing is, with something like that, um, you're going, I mean, I believe it. I believe the Bible. But on something like that, I mean, you're going way out there on a limb with people to try to get them to believe because that is so ingrained into us that it's just like unfathomable that it, anything else is different. And yet I see what the word of God is. And I just, I'm just going to stick with the word of God. So I will not find the words heliocentric or geocentric in the scripture. But I believe that when Joshua gave his command, he commanded the sun to stand still and the moon to stand still. That's what I believe. Bala, how you doing? Good day from Australia, land of convict rednecks. Can you address the issue of pagan nature of green movement? Environmentalism is big here with uh, morons voting for carbon tax. Yeah, it, it goes back to the Agenda 21 thing. It's the idea that the earth is this sacred goddess and us, us humans who are, who are um, patristic in nature. In other words, the man dominates over everything. Uh, we need to be out of the way. And a carbon tax, and by the way, Bala. A carbon tax is nothing more than a scam on the taxpayers. It's under the guise of uh, environmentalism and all this stuff, but it is a scam is what it is. Uh, and they're try they tried it here in America, and it, and it hasn't worked so far, but it's coming. Abby, and good to hear from you, Bala, by the way. Abby, hi, Pastor. We love your various teachings on not to add or take away from the Bible and uh, don't believe it, it don't believe it if it's not the Bible also very true and significant but confused why do we ritually honor Jesus God's birthday on December 25th and the Christmas traditions tree wreath 
holly bells, etc., if it is not in the Bible? That's a good question. So here's what I'm going to ask you, Abby. Okay, here's what I'm going to ask you. Is it okay, keeping in mind the liberty that we have in Christ, is it not okay to celebrate the Lord's coming? That's the question. I think it is. I think it's, I think it's perfectly normal and natural for us to celebrate the Lord's coming, to celebrate his resurrection, to have a, a feast on that day. I think it is perfectly within the, the liberty given to us as New Testament Bible-believing Christians to do that. Do we have to do it on December 25th? No. Is it a sin to do it on December 25th? No. Sin is a transgression of the law, and the law does not prohibit, nor does it endorse a, uh, a, a worship of God limited to or abstaining from a particular day. Let me explain to you. Now, there is a pagan idea, and then there is God's idea. And I'm going to ask you the question. I know what December, I probably know more about it than you do, because I've read some things that you have maybe haven't read. I don't know. But anyway, and it wasn't somebody's website where it says, ah, if, you're, if you have Christmas, you're going to hell. That's not true. You're not saved or lose your salvation because you gave a Christmas present. That's not in the Bible. Anyway, um, God is the one who designed the winter solstice. Did you know that? God is the one who ordained on day four of creation, who ordained the stars and the, and the celestial objects to be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. He designed them that way. And here we have, here we have a picture of death in December 21st in the winter solstice, and we have a picture of life in the summer solstice. We have, we have those two pictures, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't have a problem seeing the, hand, the heavens are telling, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. I don't have a problem seeing him in the things that he created and how he created them. And here's what I'm going to say to you, Abby. You don't have to let the devil have one day out of your life if you don't let him. You don't have to let him have it. December 25th or whatever day, Resurrection Sunday, or what they call Easter or whatever. And I know Eastern's a pagan festival. You don't have to let the devil have those two days and then act like they don't exist because they do. And I say to you that you can worship God as the Bible prescribes in spirit and in truth on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, January the 1st, December 25th, April the 2nd, July 4th, you can worship God and his resurrection and his coming and his second coming any day you want to. The Apostle Paul said not to judge people in regard to two days. One honoreth a day and one honoreth it not. One honoreth all days. To the one who honoreth a day, he honoreth unto the Lord, he honoreth it. To the one who honors all days, to the Lord, he honors all days. And uh, I just want to strongly encourage people. I'm not, I'm not belittling anybody, but I want to strongly encourage people. Don't be so quick to judge everybody because they gave gifts on December 25th um, or they they said the word Easter. Well, you know, on Easter Sunday we're going to don't don't do that to them. Okay. Um, let's see here. Darlene, hi, Pastor Mike. There's a portion of the preface to the KJB where the committee states something to the effect of a possibility of finding error of the text uh, needing correction in the future. I've heard many preachers pounce on that as proof that the committee knew that they, there was an error in their translation. Help! Keep up the good work. Tom and I really enjoyed the Witch Bible series you just completed. Darlene, here's what I'm going to help you with. Okay? This is my Bible. At the beginning of this old King James Bible that my mom bought me is a foreword. Okay? Did you know that I have never read that? I have never read this right here. Never one time. I don't even know what it says. Okay. However, this part of it, I've read it, and I believe it. 
there is a clear distinction and delineation. Now, if you were, you're talking about the forward of the, of the preface of the KJB, there's a lot of things there. And I've read it. I have read that preface, the, the translators uh, to the king, uh, to the reader. And in it, you can see the humility of the translators. That does not detract from the words of the scriptures themselves in the King James Bible. In other words, here's what, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find the translators say, we are mortals, we're human. We may have not quite gotten it absolutely perfect. That's what men said. Then you go to the next page and you see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That is what God said. And you will not find you will not find. And here's what all your preachers now who pounce, they said, see, it says it in the foreword that it's not the word of God. Ha ha. Gotcha. Really? Well, start in Genesis 1 and read all the way through Revelation 22, 21. And tell me whether or not there's any verse in there that says that the written Bible is not the word of God. And that it's not absolutely perfect. Can you show me? And, and uh, Darlene, they have nobody. Nobody has ever one time in the argument against a perfect Bible, nobody has ever quoted scripture to support their doctrine. Not once. They don't have scripture. So they have to go to the preface. They have to go to manuscript evidence. They have to go to West Cotton Hort. They have to go everywhere else in the world because they cannot go to Psalms, Isaiah, Revelation, Jeremiah. They cannot go there. Okay? You just say, okay, yeah, that's in the preface. Um, is it anywhere like in the Bible where it says it's not perfect? Just ask them that question. Good question. Andrea, what are your thoughts on this, on the book, This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti? It is a famous novel about spiritual warfare. I tell you, I read... Uh, this present darkness. I mean, it's, we're talking like 20 years ago, piercing the darkness, Frank Peretti. I don't know his stand on issues. I don't know his stand on doctrine or anything like that. When I read it, I'm going, you know, this is pretty interesting. I don't know that I would take everything that he said as absolute doctrine. But one of the things that this present darkness and piercing the darkness did for me was it, it kind of helped me see that the spiritual realm is very, very active all around us. Now, you can get a more solid teaching of that by going to the Scripture. But I would say this concerning Peretti's, these two books. I don't know what else he's wrote. I don't know what else he says. But concerning these two things that Peretti wrote, I can see, and it's sort of similar to my ministry. I mean, I'm sitting here talking for an hour and a half and blabbering on and and really, what I want you to do at the end of the day is pick up your Bible and read it. That's what I want you to do. And I'm going to use a lot of words to get you there. And there's nothing wrong with a helps-type ministry that draws people back into the Scriptures. And that's what, that's what that book did for me was I started looking at the Bible, which I knew to be truth, to see whether or not he, what he was saying was true. And uh, I started seeing the workings of spirits all around us, angels and devils. And I mean, I don't know that they interact exactly the way Peretti said, but the idea that we need to be aware that they're in the room here with us, I think that's a good idea. Bala, your last chance here. Bala says, Charismatics, Mental Costals, Emergence, Greenies, Transhumanists, and New Agers are all closet Hindus. Most of their beliefs come from that belief system. There's a reason I call the guy Benny Hindu. And Bala has a right to say that because his family is all Hindu. Uh, Colleen says, check your email to talk about raw foodists and colonics opening up the third eye. Who's it from, Colleen? And I only have like 15 seconds left. I mean, I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, so if this is something you want me to talk about, let's deal with it uh, sometime in the future. Oh, look. There they are. Sorry. Anyway, I've had a, I've had a good time today. Now, um, there's a chance. In fact, I'm reasonably sure that I will not be here on Tuesday. And I'll tell you why. 
my wife, uh, several years ago, had a lump removed. It's a beautiful thing. And she was told after the lump was removed, she didn't have cancer, but she has precancerous cells. And I made a commitment to my wife that every time she went for a, a mammogram or a check, that I would be there by her side. And her appointment is on Tuesday. And she asked me, she said, my appointment's on Tuesday, are you going? And I said, sweetie, I always come first. And so I will not be here on Tuesday. There will not be a PMO on Tuesday. All right? I love you. I hope you understand. Uh, I'm excused. All right. Thank you. God bless you. I love you. I've had a great time with you today. Thank you. And uh, and keep me in your prayers. Okay. As the ministry grows, the attacks grow. I'm glad we're together again. Okay. And um, I just, just pray for me. All right. I love you. My neighbor. Appreciate you. Bye-bye. Hi, television neighbor. I'm glad we're together again.